Okay, so um, we've actually been working hard uh, over the years on, on several theories of deep learning uh, using a diversity of theoretical techniques, uh, a lot coming from physics actually. So tools like non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, um, uh, you know, dynamic mean field theory, system mechanics of random landscapes and so on, Ramani and geometry, random matrix theory, free probability theory and all that. I can't possibly talk about all of that. Uh, so, I'll, so I'll, but, but if you're interested in, in sort of this line of work, we, you know, annual reviews of Kenneth's Matter Physics recently asked us to um, write a review article on the statistical mechanics of deep learning. So even physicists are interested in how physics can be used to shed light on uh, theory and deep learning. So we reviewed a bunch of topics from expressivity to landscapes to signal propagation, generalization, uh, generative models, and so on. Um, it'll appear soon, but uh, send me an email if you want a copy. Um, we'll put it up on the archive soon as well. Um, so anyway, what I will talk about today is, uh, you know, generalization is, of course, very uh, popular uh, in this community. It's a very important question uh, in deep learning. So we'll talk about our, our work on uh, a theory of generalization uh, in, in a deep linear network that yields very explicit expressions for generalization dynamics uh, over training time. And then I don't usually talk about my work on brain science at conferences like this, but I was actually kind of baited by Leon Batuge, who during the panel... Uh, discussion said that deep learning has nothing to say about how the brain works. Of course, the brain isn't one monolithic entity. There are several different subsystems. So I wanted to provide some counterexamples to how considerations of deep learning theory and machine learning in general could indeed shed light on the brain. Uh, in particular, explaining the fine structure of the primate retina through optimal convolutional autoencoders and explaining the origin of hexagonal lattices in the brain uh, through recurrent neural networks and non-negative principal components analysis. Okay. So let's get started. So the work on generalization uh, dynamics was done with Andrew Sachs and Andrew Lampinen and Jay McCollin, and there's two, two papers here. Um, looks like this, anyway, that's okay. So, um, so of course the dynamics of learning in deep nonlinear networks is quite complicated. You can have these plateaus and then sudden drops in the training error. The test error over training time can be non-monotonic, uh, yielding overfitting and bad predictions and new held out examples. It turns out that the training or the learning dynamics of deep linear networks exhibit both of these phenomena. Uh, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the dynamics of a um, just a two-weight layer, three-neuron layer uh, linear network. Uh, we can also do deeper linear networks as well. I won't show you all the details of that. Now, of course, the input-output map of these networks is trivial because the composition of linear functions is linear, but the learning dynamics is non-trivial. So, for example, if you have oh, okay, if you have squared loss on the output, then the loss landscape over weight, over weight space is quartic in the weights. So when you do a gradient descent, you'll get uh, dynamical equations that are cubic in the weights. Therefore, the loss landscape is non-convex and so forth. Um, we work in the limit of uh, uh, small uh, learning rates, so we can reduce to differential e equations. Uh, because of the linearity of the input-output map, what drives learning is the input correlation matrix and the input-output correlation matrix. How correlated is one neuron in the input with one neuron in the output averaged over the training set? Okay. So this is the statistics of data that drives learning. These are the differential equations that drive learning, as promised, they're nonlinear coupled ODEs that are cubic in the weights. Um, you can find exact solutions to these learning dynamics. We did so in 2014. One way to summarize them is if you take the product of the, of the weights from input to output, you can express it in terms of the singular value decomposition of the input-output correlation matrix. We're assuming the input correlation matrix is white. And what happens is it learns a time-dependent buildup of the singular value decomposition of the input-output correlation matrix, where the time-dependence, so these are the singular vectors of the input-output correlation matrix, the singular values of the, of the network uh, evolve dynamically in time in a sigmoidal fashion, where if you start, say, from small weight initializations, the singular values of the, of the network will initially be small, and it'll learn the largest singular value in the training data first, the, the next one second, and the next one third, and so on. So basically, it builds up the singular value decomposition where each singular mode in the input-output correlation matrix of the data is learned in a time given by one over the singular value. So the generalizable lesson, I think, here is that stronger statistical structure is learned earlier. In this setting, we know exactly how to quantify strength, data singular values, and we can compute speed in terms of the data singular values. 
Uh, you can generalize this to, to deeper networks, and you can get exact solutions for deeper linear networks as well. The, the dynamics of learning does indeed change as you have multiple layers. You get higher cooperativity. Um, so one way to think about this, so, so this is, these are the sigmoidal curves that determine the singular value of the neural network as a function of the singular value of the data as a function of time. But you can also ask, for any given singular value in the data, what fraction of that singular value is learned at a given time as a function of that singular value? And what you'll see, of course, is that learn, large singular values in the data are learned earlier, singular modes in the data are learned earlier. So you can visualize the learning process in a very visceral way as a singular mode detection wave that sweeps in from large singular values to small singular values in the data. And as time goes forward, the wave sweeps in and singular uh, modes in the data that have singular values larger than a particular threshold are all learned. Those smaller than the threshold are not yet learned. Okay? So that this idea will, will, uh, uh, kind of explains what's going on as far as generalization works. Okay, but now to talk about generalization, we need a model of the data. So we're gonna operate in a, a teacher-student framework. We're going to imagine that the teacher generates the data, and the teacher itself is a linear one-neuron one neuron hidden layer network. Uh, with true weights, W bar 1, 2, and W bar 2, 3. Okay? So, the so, of course, all that really matters is the comp composition of the weight matrices. And we're going to assume that a random distribution of white inputs comes in and generates outputs, but those outputs are corrupted by noise. Okay? So this is the output of the teacher network, okay? and, and that's our model for the data. The student can be much, much larger than the teacher. It doesn't have to have, for example, a low rank constraint. So the student can be overparameterized. Okay? Again, the only thing that drives learning in the student is, of course, the input-output correlational structure of the data. We're assuming the inputs are white. And then all that matters is the input-output correlation matrix. Because of the structure of the inputs and outputs, this input-output correlation matrix is a perturbation of the low-rank teacher weights plus a high-dimensional high, high noise matrix. Okay? So this is how the teacher is buried in the training data. Okay? So now that we understand how the teacher is buried in the training data, we can compute generalization, as a, a, a test error as a function of time. Okay? The basic mathematics that we exploit is simple random matrix theory. We work in the usual high dimensional statistics limit where the number of inputs and the number of outputs are both going to infinity, but their ratio is order one, and the rank of the teacher is order one. Okay? So in that limit, you can understand how the singular mode structure of the data relates to the singular mode structure of the teacher. Okay? So basically, you have the true teacher with singular values s bar. right? You have the data with singular values s hat. And you have the singular vectors of the data versus the singular vectors of the teacher. Because you're just obtaining sigma 3, 1 by adding a, a noise matrix to W bar, the noise will knock the singular vectors off. But the amount they get knocked off uh, depends on the size of the teacher's singular value. So what happens is you get a phase transition that's well known as the BBP phase transition, where if the singular value, for a fixed noise level, if the singular value of the teacher is small, the inner product between the data singular vector and the corresponding teacher singular vector will be zero on average. The phase transition occurs when the signal rises above a certain threshold, dependent on the level of the noise. And above that threshold, the overlap between the data singular vector and the teacher singular vector rises. And the larger the singular value of the teacher, the larger the overlap between the student's uh, singular, sorry, the data singular vectors and the teacher singular vector, so that's good. Of, and what about the singular values of the data versus the student? So because this is a low rank matrix plus a, a noise matrix, it has a very well-known structure. Uh, the noise matrix contributes a bulk of singular values, but then the low rank teacher, in this case uh, a rank three teacher, if the, sing, if the teacher's singular values are large enough, they contribute outlier singular values. And the position of the outlier singular values in relation to the true singular values of the teacher uh, approaches the unity line as the singular values of the teacher get large. If, it doesn't, if the teacher's singular values are small, 
these outlier singular values will, will um, come close to the bulk, basically. So that's the, that's the relationship between the structure that we wish to learn, i.e. W bar the teacher, and the structure that the student gets, i.e. the input-output correlation matrix. Now that we have all of that, there are explicit formulas for all of these expressions. We can plug them in into explicit formulas for, for both the training error and the test error and obtain explicit formulas for both as a function of training time. No bounds involved, just exact asymptotic results in the usual high dimensional statistics limits. Okay. So what does that give us? So here's an example of a rank N student and a rank one teacher. They both have one hidden layer. Uh, the training error, as expected, drops monotonically. There's a sudden drop here and then a slow drop here. But the, tr the sorry, the training error. And then the test error is non-monotonic. It drops and then it rises. The solid curves are theory. The triangles are experiments. There's a nice match between theory and experiments. There's explicit formulas for all of this. What's interesting is that there's an optimal early stopping time. And you can compute analytically the test error at the optimal early stopping time. And it depends only on the structure of the data, not at all on the student architecture, as long as the student is expressive enough, i.e. its rank is higher than that of the teacher. Okay. Why do you get this structure? Again, you can understand that from the perspective of this singular mode detection wave. So imagine you have a rank one teacher, so you have only one singular value here. Learning corresponds to the sweeping of a singular mode detection wave from, from high singular values to small. As the wave passes this data singular value, it learns uh, the, the, the corresponding singular vectors in the data. And because there's an outlier singular value, what it learns is related to the student. So as the, as the wave passes the singular vector, that corresponds to the sudden drop in the training error and the sudden drop in the test error. However, as the singular mode detection wave penetrates further into this marsenko pasteur C, it's learning about the particular realization of noise in the training data, which has nothing to do with the teacher because of, because of the zero inner products here, right? So then, later in training, you're learning about the noise. So you're explaining your training data better, the noise structure in your training data, but you're getting worse in predicting on held out examples because you're not learning anything about the teacher. Okay, so that's why you, that, that's kind of a visceral, intuitive, physical picture for why you get this kind of shape of the learning curves. All of this theory and simulations and their match generalized to deeper uh, networks, say with five layers of neurons, three hidden layers of weights. Again, the tester at the optimal stopping time is independent of the student hidden units. Again, it depends only on the structure of the data, not on the student architecture. How do these results qualitatively match with what goes on in nonlinear networks? There is a qualitative match. We, of course, don't have a theory here, but we've done the same exact architectures but replaced the linear with leaky ReLU units at all hidden layers. And you see the same structure for the same data set, a sudden drop in the training error and followed by a continuous drop, a sudden drop in the test error followed by a rise. So at least the theory of learning dynamics, nonlinear learning dynamics in deep linear networks qualitatively recapitulates what we see in, in say, these leaky ReLU networks. Um, by the way, of course, this was all inspired by this, this famous paper that all of us are citing. Uh, there was another intriguing result in that paper, which was there is a difference in the learning dynamics between learning on true data versus learning on noisy data. So this is the learning curve as a function of training time on the true data. This is on various random permutations. And so what happens is it, take, it, it, it takes longer to learn. So there really is a difference uh, there. This can also be recapitulated in our theory analytically. The basic idea is the true data has these outlier singular values, but if we randomize the data so as to preserve the input-output correlation matrix, the output-output correlation matrix, but destroy the input-output correlation matrix, we expand the marsenko pasteur C, but we destroy the outlier singular values. So it takes longer for the singular mode detection wave to penetrate the marsenko pasteur C, which is why we get longer training times in the randomized data compared to the, to the real data. Okay. All right, so just an intuitive picture of what's going on. The key challenge of machine learning is, of course, that we're always optimizing on the wrong landscape, right? We're optimizing on the training error landscape, but we care about the test error landscape. So 
it turns out that the learning dynamics, at least in this simple setting, is going past a sequence of saddle points. And the optimal early stopping time where the test error is minimized is not at the global minimum of the training error. You, you want to get past the last saddle point associated with the smallest data singular value that contains information about the teacher. So the trajectory really matters uh, here. Um, you don't want to get to the global minimum. You, you want to stop somewhere here on the training error so that you do minimize your test error. Okay. So just to summarize uh, this part, we analytically computed training and, training and test error as a function of training time in deep linear networks. The results qualitatively reflect learning dynamics in deep nonlinear nets. Uh, the generalization error, or test error, as a function of training time depends in a sensitive but completely computable way on the initial student weight strength, the initialization, the initialization actually matters, the rank of the teacher and the teacher SNRs, i.e. the signal to noise ratio of the singular modes of the teacher. But the, the test error in an optimal early stopping time doesn't depend on the student network size as long as it's expressed as enough. So these networks basically learn the most important structure in the data first, where importance is quantified by data singular values. And then they only learn later less important structure, uh, they only learn less important structure later. So traject just as Sanjeev was saying, I mean, trajectory really matters here. It's not just about the loss landscape. We can also explain why learning scramble data takes longer than learning structure, structure data. And a lesson is that any attempt to bound generalization error solely in terms of student network architecture or student network capacity alone is likely to yield a loose bound. The data, of course, matters. Um, so to really understand generalization, I think in agreement with a lot of people here, we do really need a theory of the structure of real world data sets. That theory is completely missing at the moment and its impact on the learning dynamics, and presumably good generalization success may originate through some kind of conspiracy in the structure of data and the learning dynamics. They're somehow matched to each other in these deep networks, and I think that's what we really need to understand in more complex settings. Okay, so now let's move to, um, let's move to uh, uh, the brain, actually. Uh, again, this is not standard stuff I talk about in this community, but, but I think we can have some fun here. Okay, so, so let's um, try to explain the structure of the primate retina through optimal convolutional autoencoders. That's what we're gonna do. And this was uh, uh, presented at NeurIPS last year. So here's the basic idea. Your retina is actually a one hidden layer neural network, okay? So experimentalists can shine light on photoreceptors in the retina. It propagates through a hidden layer of bipolar cells. And then you get these ganglion cells each one of you have about one million optic nerve fibers and everything you know about your visual world is transmitted through only one million optic nerve fibers. Okay? Similarly in, in primates, in, in, in macaque monkeys, for example. A, a dominant summary of the computation that these ganglion cells are doing is that the, you can roughly model them as a space-time linear filter passed through a threshold, a threshold of nonlinearity so a key issue is what is the distribution of linear filters that, say, the primate retina uses? It turns out that the primate retina has multiple cell types, which, loosely speaking, can correspond to convolutional channels in, in a convolutional neural network. There's roughly spatial symmetry in this primate retina. So what are the dominant cell types? This is actual data. The space-time filters are, are approximately space-time separable. This is the spatial structure of the filter and this is the temporal structure of the filter. So you have kind of two major cell types, parasols and midgets, and they come in on and off flavors. On cells respond to an increment of light, off cells respond to a decrement of light, okay? And this is their structure in Fourier space. So parasol cells are, uh, have large uh, spatial filters, whereas midget cells have small spatial, fil spatial filters. The, the parasol cells have high frequency or fast temporal filters, and the, and the midget cells have um, low frequency or slow temporal filters. Okay, so in neuroscience, there's a huge experimental push to really understand the distribution of cell types in the brain, but we really have no theory for why we have so many cell types. We can, we can address this now in the retina, okay? So again, just to summarize, you have these two classes of cells, midgets and parasols, uh, midgets are small in space and slow in time. Parasols are large in space and fast in time. 
It turns out the small cells are high in number density versus the, the large cells, and they're very sensitive versus the, the large cells. So why is it that there's this conspiracy or, or covariation between space and time? That's, that's a key issue we'd like to understand. Why do you, uh -huh. uh, why do you say this is uh, efficient coding? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. So the theoretical framework that we're going to use to try to explain why such structure might be optimal is basically trying to use uh, autoencoders. So the theoretical principle is that if we attempt to accurately encode the structure of natural movies, we need to think really about movie statistics, not just natural image statistics, to explain this covariation between space and time. And we have a cost function on the firing rates of, of, of these neurons. Then we can derive these filters. Okay? So um, the basic idea is we, we feed natural movies into an, uh, a, uh, um, an autoencoder that could be convolutional, so it has multiple convolutional channels or maybe only one type of channel. We ask how well we can decode the natural movie using an optimal linear decoder. Right? So decoding performance will then depend in a non-trivial way on the filters. And we can analytically optimize the filters for at least for a linear autoencoder. Now, of course, the key issue that arises is, again, everything depends on the data. We have to feed in natural image statistics, natural movie image statistics, to get an answer that matches the primate retina. So what is the structure of natural movies? In a linear autoencoder, the only aspect of the statistical structure of natural movies that matters is its power spectrum. So this is a, a cartoon depiction of the power spectrum of natural movies. This is spatial frequency, and this is temporal frequency. And it turns out the power spectra of natural movies have these hyperbolic contours of equal power, so that there are these two tails in the spectrum, one that's high spatial frequency and low temporal frequency, and one that's low spatial frequency and high temporal frequency. It turns out, if you analytically optimize the filters uh, across multiple cell, uh, cell types or convolutional channels, You'll do better if you have more than one channel. You'll do better, for example, if you have two channels and slightly better if you have three channels. And they op the optimal filter is specialized to process different parts of the power spectrum. Basically, this part will correspond to um, midget cells and this part will correspond to parasol cells. So basically, yeah, that's what I was saying here. Two t cell types can more accurately encode natural movies with lower firing rates by specializing to encode different parts of the natural movie power spectrum. The midget cells are here. They're at high spatial frequency, low temporal frequency. You have to maintain the correct convolutional strides so you don't miss parts of space. So the, their spatial receptive field is small, which means you need many cells, and you don't want them to fire a lot, so they have to have low firing rates. On the other hand, the parasol cells are low spatial frequency. They have large receptive fields. They're high temporal frequency. Uh, because they're large, you don't need as many of the cells to tile physical space. And because there's not many of them, they can fire more. Yeah. So I'm confused. So if your autoencoder is this linear, why do you get any spatial locality? Because isn't it just going to be Fourier uh, modes? So you could just do it. Well, we, we have a convolutional constraint. So once you put that convolutional constraint in, right. you, do, you don't get the PCA. Right. Right. A and actually, we have a stride as well that we fix. And then we scan all possible strides to find the optimal stride for each convolutional channel. In, in the autoencoder. In, in the autoencoder, yeah. Now, we augmented this with a nonlinear autoencoder simulation we, where we put in the rectification. And this is what we get. So again, this was the data that I showed you earlier. And this is the outcome of a nonlinear autoencoder where each hidden neuron rectifies using a threshold like a ReLU unit. And as you can see, once you optimize these filters to auto optimize the neural network to autoencode natural movies, you see a beautiful correspondence between the four optimal cell types in the model and four optimal cell types in the primate retina, suggesting that the primate retina may indeed have evolved to optimally process natural movies. Now, this theory doesn't apply to other species. For example, mice have a very different structure of their retina. 40% of their cell types are devoted to detecting overhead predators. It's very, very different. OK. Now, going up deeper into the brain to a more cognitive uh, phenomenon like navigation, I'd like to try to explain um, hexagonal lattices in the brain using the theory of recurrent neural networks 
and the theory of non-negative principal components analysis. Okay, so again, bringing machine learning in to understand the brain. And this is a, a, a manuscript in preparation. Um, okay, so here's a striking fact. I, I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of grid cells? Okay, a small fraction. Okay, so the, these, this was the subject of a Nobel Prize in physiology a few years ago. But basically, they occur in a, a part of the brain, it's say the mouse brain, also the human brain, the bat brain, uh, the primate brain, related to navigation where here you can have a mouse traverse a 2D enclosure. Okay? And you can record from a single cell as the mouse is traversing this 2D enclosure. And you can ask, where does the cell fire? Okay? This is the average firing rate map of a single cell as a function of the position of the mouse in the 2D enclosure. Red means it fired a lot. Blue means it didn't fire very much. And as you can see, this particular cell fires if and only if the mouse is at the vertices of a hexagonal grid. Okay, that's kind of shocking. It just goes to show how little theory is respected in neuroscience because you can win a Nobel Prize for discovering this without having any theory for why it exists or what it might be good for. Okay, but anyways, <laughs> I, I don't, it, it's an amazing finding. It deserves a Nobel Prize. But, why huh? Why is it amazing? Why is it amazing? So, why, so amazing? why would, why would, you, would you have expected hexagonal grids deep within the brain of a mouse as it moves around? That, that's, that it's so regular. Um, there, there's many more features I'm not telling you. So this is one cell. There's an entire module of cells that have the same periodic uh, lattice structure, but different phases. And then as you go along the dorsal ventral axis, there's different modules that tile phase space and then have different, it's, it's a crystal. It's a, it's a crystalline lattice in the brain. And slightly confused. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the experimental observation. You can explain it theoretically by looking for hexagonal patterns in the brain at an instant of time, and those patterns move around. But that's a theoretical construct that hasn't yet been experimentally proven. But, but this graph, so this box is an actual this, this is XY position of the mouse, and this is a single cell. There's many more cells like this, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm almost done. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, so, so we can, so the question is, is this a historical accident that requires detailed biological constraints or does it emerge naturally from solving a computational problem? So recently we've been able to show that if you, can, so these networks are involved in navigation, telling the mouse where it is, one way you can know where you are is by integrating your velocity over time to compute position. So we asked a recurrent neural network to integrate velocity to compute position. These are place cell outputs. And we asked what internal representations appear in the network. And quite generically, as long as you impose positivity conditions and firing rates, individual neurons in the network, their firing as a function of position, look like hexagonal grids. Now the question is why? We have a theory for that. Uh, without going into details, the basic idea is that this learning dynamics can be roughly thought of as doing non-negative principal components analysis on the desired output representation. That corresponds to maximizing eigenvectors of the, of the desired output correlation matrix subject to a positivity constraint. The simplest positivity we can constraint we can impose is through a cubic nonlinearity of this fashion. This cubic nonlinearity will select triplets of eigenmodes of this correlation matrix. Those eigenmodes correspond to wave uh, Fourier modes. And the triplets are such that the Fourier wave vectors in Fourier space have to sum to zero. The selection of Fourier modes of three wave vectors that sum to zero, their superposition yields a hexagonal grid. That's the take home message. But anyways, we can mathematically analyze the learning dynamics of this network, approximate it, and analytically solve the approximation and show why hexagonal grids uh, naturally emerge. Okay, so again, uh, I couldn't talk about all the stuff we've been doing. I, if it were not for Leon Batu, I probably would have talked about more of the mathematical stuff we've been working on. But this is a, a list of papers, and the red ones are the ones I talked about today. Thanks. <laughs>